sometimes we get a little background noise. Anyway, here we go. Hi everyone, welcome to the Bay Area Content Marketing Meetup. My name is Dennis, I'm the organizer of the meetup. Uh, we're here today to talk about how to think about SEO in 2022. Our presenter is Dale Bertrand, president at Fire and Spark. Let me just give you a quick overview of what Dale's gonna talk about today. Uh, for, a de for over a decade, SEO experts have relied on strategies like keyword targeted content, on-page optimization, and aggressive email promotion. Hopefully not too aggressive. Uh, but in 2022, it's clear that these techniques are losing their effectiveness because they rely on big budgets, coordination with a web developer, and spammy email outreach. Fortunately, there's a better way to grow organic traffic in the age of AI search engines, and that is pur purpose-driven SEO. That's what Dale will talk about today. So Dale, thanks for joining us and take it away. All right, well, awesome. Dennis, thank you for the invite. I love talking about SEO. This is um, probably the third talk I've done this year, and I've got like another 20 scheduled. So um, you guys are getting me fresh, and you're getting the information fresh um, in the year. So that's good. So what, I want to set the stage a little bit here. I mean, when, when we're talking about search engine optimization, we're actually talking about optimizing for Google. Like Google is uh, the only game in town um, for the projects that I work on. And during the, the talk that I did last week, somebody asked, well, what about Bing? Why are we not thinking about other search engines? And for me as a marketer in the US, my customers are on Google. So that's, that's where um, I put the majority of of my time and effort. So Google handles the vast majority of searches and there's more competition than ever in Google for top rankings, as we all know, um, but their algorithm is changing. You know, like it's been, it's getting more complicated, especially with the advent of AI. So what does this mean for marketers? For us, it really means that we need new strategies. So the old best practices, this is what I talk about a lot, is like SEO best practices. Everybody wants to know, like, what should I be doing? Um, if everybody's doing SEO best practices and SEO is a zero sum game for the number one position that you want for your most valuable keyword, then uh, you're, you're kind of in trouble. Like you really are, you really do need to be doing, doing something else. So if crafting better strategies really starts with understanding how Google's algorithm has changed and where it's headed. So moving, I want to see if I can get my clicker to work here. It might not work. Ah, it might work. I was actually pressing the wrong direction. So Google founders, when they started Google, they were in grad school. So because they were in grad school, they were keenly aware of how academics are evaluated. And in the academic world, um, academics are evaluated in part based on the number of papers that they publish, but also whether those published those published papers are cited by other researchers in their work. So basically, if they get a lot of citations, then that means that it's a it's a valuable paper. It's an influential paper. So what Google's founders did was they took this one key insight and they applied it to the web. So what I'm showing here, my clicker works, is this is a, a paper I had my name on when I was in, in grad school. Um, forget the jibber jabber about um, indexing shock based and all that. But at the end of the paper are the citations. These are the paper, these are the papers that we read that influenced our work. And when we cite them, we're basically acknowledging they were helpful and we're saying this paper was useful to us. So on the web, if you think about it like um, I might be a I run a dog, uh, sorry, a pet store online or something like that. If that if my pet store has clickable links from the American Vet Veterinary Medicine Association um, and the Boston Globe and and Facebook and Rover.com, like those are those are helpful uh, from an authority perspective. So basically, Google's going to see these backlinks, look at them as endorsements of my online pet store. And um, give us and give the, the store better rankings. So basically, the original Google's original algorithm, you know, the more links you had and the better those links were, like the better you would rank and you would get the, the top positions in Google. But why do the best websites have 
the most links. And it's really because those websites are the most useful. They have the most useful information. Um, they're most relevant if you're shopping for a product or planning a vacation or looking up information about a medical condition, like they have the answer. And that's why Google in their original algorithm, the PageRank algorithm, they were able to use the, the link structure of the web to figure out which web which websites and pages were the best. So basically, Google's original algorithm, the PageRank algorithm, was rules-based. Nowadays, the algorithm is AI-based, and AI really changes the game with the um, way, way Google works. And this is a bit of an oversimplification for sure, um, but when Google was rules-based, those rules were intended to determine the most useful websites and pages on the web. Um, and now that it's a lot more complex, Google's not using the rules to make the decisions. Google's really relying, using AI that's relying on its training to make decisions. So it's really best to think of Google as a prediction machine. So what Google is doing is predicting what you're most likely to click on. So if I go to Google and I type in Obama's dog, Google is going to predict what I, what it thinks I'll click on. So if you look at the page, the search results page for this, um, for this query, you can see that Google thinks I'm likely to click on a picture because maybe I'm looking for a picture of Obama's dog or Google thinks I'll click on the Wikipedia page because I want to know what the dog died of or the dog's breed or Google thinks I might click on the answer to the question, is Obama's dog still alive? So this is basically um, what Google's AI is doing. Um, and in other words, Google's AI is trying to figure out what is the intent behind the queries so that it can show you what it thinks you are looking for. Next. So how does Google train its AI? Super important. So let me move. So then one thing Google's doing is they have humans. So these are human quality raters that are looking at websites and grading them. Like, are they trustworthy? Does the information look accurate? And Google's not using these humans to rank your website. Google's really using these humans to build a training data set that it uses to train its AI and the AI is doing the ranking. Now, um, you can look at the, well, down towards the bottom here is the guidelines. There's, a, there's like a 180 page document that Google gives to its quality raters. And this is how they learn how to rate websites. What are they looking for? They're looking for trust factors. They're looking for, is it credible? Uh, things like that. Then the other way that Google is training its AI is search behavior. So every time you go to Google and you search for something, Google is predicting, remember Google's a prediction machine, what it thinks you're gonna click on. And then it shows you a bunch of things. Like I showed you everything Google uh, shows you when you type in Obama's dog. And based on what you click, Google's watching you. And Google is able to use that data, what you actually click on. And if you stay on the website, do you come back from Google to, to the search results page immediately? Do you refine your search? Do you click on another result? Google's using all that, that behavior to train its AI uh, because it's learning to do basically better predictions of what you'll click on and stay on. And then also there's some hand tuning going on where like at the end of the day, Google's algorithm is not one big AI machine. There's actually multiple AI algorithms that do, doing a lot of different things. And the engineers that are working on Google's AI can choose which algorithm is best for different, different classifiers or interpreting the meaning behind a query. But they can also um, dial up and dial down the strength of some signals, which is kind of cheating when you're talking about AI, but sometimes they need to nudge it in the right direction. And then also uh, Google's engineers can find new signals, basically new data to, to feed into the AI that the AI can use when it's making ranking decisions. So there is a, a tuning component to the algorithm. Um, so how Google's using AI. So Google's using AI to understand queries, like what am I really searching for when I type in Obama's dog, predict search behavior like we talked about, and evaluating the, the quality of content and the relevance to queries, and then also classifying content. You can think of like not safe for work content that needs to be classified and dealt with separately. Um, and then also defending against manipulation. A lot of what Google's doing is defending against SEO people like me who, you know, I did some tricks back in the day that used to work. And then 
it's also the AI is learning from its interactions with humans, the human searchers that are using the search engine. So why is the AI better than the rules-based search engine, like the page rank, the, well, the original page rank algorithm? So you're going to get better results, um, so better search results than the human-defined rules. And the AI can learn. So it, the AI is a learning algorithm. It's not, it's not a hard-coded set of rules. And it can operate at scale, billions of pages on the web. And it's faster to make algorithm updates, like instead of rebuilding the algorithm you just you fix the training set and google's every night they're they're running um different versions of training and tweaks to the algorithm to see if they can come up with an iteration that gets slightly better results and then semantic search semantic search is, is about google understanding what's on a page beyond just the words that are on the page so if it was an article about microsoft um google could understand that oh microsoft's a company and microsoft is hiring and Google would understand that those are a thing. So the AI can understand that those are a thing where the rules-based engine was really looking for words on a page. And then the AI can be trained by um, real humans who are not computer scientists, <laughs> which is important because Google wants to understand what I'm looking for and what types of websites I trust um, beyond just like, you know, being the hand tweaks by computer scientists. So it's important to realize that when we say Google's an AI based search engine, Google's using a lot of different AI algorithms. Like AI just means any algorithm that can, that can, um, you know, can approximate human intelligence. So there's deep learning algorithms and, you know, natural language processing algorithms. There's, there's a lot of them. So you can, should think of Google as a, a collection of these algorithms that are all doing all these different things that we're talking about. So my background, I gave a hint to this before, but um, my, my entire career I've been at the intersection of technology and marketing. I studied AI in grad school where we were building a search engine along the lines of the, the paper that I showed earlier. Um, I built a supercomputer for the NSA. I was working as an engineer back then. Um, but I, after that project, I started my agency. So I've been running my agency for the last 12 years. And my agency is Fire and Spark. We focus on SEO. That's all we do all day, every day. And we worked with a bunch of clients towards the bottom here, some of which you may have heard of. So it's important to understand Google's dual mission. So their stated mission is to understand the world's information and make it accessible. But to really understand how the algorithm is evolving, you have to understand that they're also interested in thriving as a business. So the Google founders, they own jets and houses and they want more jets and houses and, and that's important. So how will Google achieve its dual mission? So the answer is really happy searchers. So if they can make us happy, deliver, you know, find results that answer our questions and satisfy us, then they're going, they're going to, we're going to continue to use this, the search engine and they can sell their ads and they basically accomplish both of their missions. So for us as marketers, we really must have the most trustworthy and useful content in our market in order to, for Google to show us and, and basically with, you know, what they're, they're trying to make their, their searchers happy. So we want to talk about the evolution of search al algorithms here. We talked about the early stages of search algorithms. Back in the day, if you typed words into Google, Google was simply looking for pages on the web that had those words on them. And then Google would rank them based on the page rank algorithm, like the strength of the links to the website, to those websites um, and the value, you know, how many there were and how, how um, authoritative those links were. Nowadays, we have AI search engines, and it's a little bit different, where basically Google can understand the words on the page, including context and misspellings. Um, if, I'm, if I'm searching for, if I do a search in Google where I'm searching for NFL teams, and then I type in a, a, un, next after that an unrelated search where I say Jaguars, Google will show me the Jacksonville Jaguars because there's context to the search when I now, when I type in the word Jaguars, because I'd been searching for uh, the NFL teams prior to that. And then Google's AI will choose the best results that satisfy the context and the intent behind every query as Google understands it. And, and the AI can rank pages based on the searcher's needs and learn, as I was saying before, from its interactions. It learns based on what you click on and if you stay on those websites or if you come back. 
So you can approximate this. So I went to Google and I typed in, what is go time? And I put um, quotes around it. And when you put quotes around it, you're really telling Google to search for these words on pages. And what Google found was it found two definitions of what is go time. The reason why Google is showing these two pages is because they have what is go time at the beginning of the title. And that's what the old school algorithm used to do. When I removed the quotes, I can see what Google really does nowadays. And when I typed in what is go time, Google gave the answer Google gave us or gave me is a, a software program called go time because google thinks oh you might be looking or remember google's a prediction machine so google's predicting that i might click on um go time which is a a software product and then google also gave me the urban dictionary definition of go time the phrase go time and then google also thought i might be looking for where did go time come from or what is the meaning of do time and do time is like doing time in prison or something like that but Google looked at this and said, oh, he might have meant, this might be a misspelling. He might have meant to say due time. And then also where it says, what, what does go back in time mean? So Google also thought maybe I was looking, trying to figure out what it means to go back in time. Um, but you can see how Google's really evolved from a search engine that's looking for words on pages to a search engine that's trying really hard to understand what did he really mean when he typed that in? so that Google can give us the right answer. And I wanna see thumbs up if this makes sense because it's kind of the core of it. I wanna see if you guys, all right, all right. I see a bunch of you um, are getting it. So that's cool. Um, so then many, this really means that many popular SEO tactics are outdated. So if you were keyword stuffing, like the more we put our keyword on the page, the more likely it is to rank or um, buying keyword domains. Like um, if the domain has the word jewelry in it, then we're gonna rank for the keyword jewelry. Um, writing content for bots, buying backlinks, putting content in article directories, po guest posting on irrelevant websites, uh, thin content, so, so content with only a, a little bit of words on it, and uh, pages that for every keyword variation, so we don't need a page for 3D printer and then another one for 3D printers because Google knows that they're the same thing. And then comment spam doesn't work clickbait articles don't work, anchor text manipulation, where we used to have links, internal links on our website and put keywords in the anchor text. Um, it, it's still good to do that, but it doesn't work the way it used to when we used to do page rank sculpting. And thin local pages. So this is when maybe you, you have an online education program and you make a page for every city um, on your, every city in the country. Like these are thin local pages that don't work anymore if you're not adding value or adding some kind of useful information to those pages. So where should we focus in 2022? So the technical approach to SEO is when you're doing things like focus on page load speed or spending a lot of time on crawl efficiency. We want Google to be able to crawl our website really well or um, even the page layout. And if you think about these things, these don't necessarily help Google achieve its mission. So if your website is really slow, like I go to your homepage and it takes 10 seconds or a minute for your homepage to load, then yeah, that's a problem and you're going to get dinged by Google. But if your page is loading pretty fast and you cut the speed in half, that doesn't really help. Like you, if you, either you have good information or you don't, either you have the answer to the question that your customers are looking for or you don't. And same thing with crawl efficiency, same thing with like your page layout. So you wanna be really careful chasing things like Google's uh, core web vitals. Like if there's something really broken, then fine, fix it, but you wanna quickly move on. So Google's working really hard to make the technical manipulations that we used to do for SEO useless so that um, all these types of optim optimizations are obsolete. And the reason why is they can deliver the most useful results to searchers regardless of your optimizations. So if you think about that, like we're talking about SEO, which is search engine optimization. And I'm saying that Google's trying to deliver the best content regardless of your optimization. And that makes sense because Google's trying to give searchers the answer. They're trying to give searchers useful information. And optimizing doesn't really make sense unless, like I said, there was something broken about your website or it was so slow that Google was having trouble um, delivering that content to people who were searching. 
So in 2022, technical issues can hurt your SEO, but technical fixes aren't going to grow your traffic. So if there's something broken, fix it. But if you want to grow your traffic, you're really going to have to focus elsewhere. So where should you be investing your resources? They should really be, well, first of all, minimize technical SEO. You want to make sure there's something, there's not anything broken that would prevent people from visiting your website or something that would prevent Google from seeing your content or indexing your content, but then you want to quickly move on. And you want to move on to targeted content and multi-factor authority. This is what I'm going to talk about. So targeted content is all about building the right content. And multi-factor authority is all about proving to Google that you're an authority, that you're the right, you're the right, um, the right information to show for a given keyword on a given topic. And Google used to pretty heavily rely on backlinks and they still do like backlinks are still an important factor, but there's a lot more to it nowadays. So where I am putting my resources and my websites, the websites that I own, is the vast majority is going into targeted content, multi-factor authority, and some resources into technical and on-page SEO. But really what I want to do is fix anything that's broken and move on to content and authority. So I'm going to talk about targeted content. It's really about search intent. So quick story here. My, my daughter, she's nine years old. For her birthday, she wanted to go to the American Girl doll store in Boston, it but unfortunately the store closed. So I told her that I would take her to the American Girl doll store in New York. But right before her birthday, this thing called COVID happened and we were unable to travel to New York. So um, I went to Google and I typed in American Girl because I wanted to understand, well, are there any other stores that we, maybe we could drive to or something like that? And Google showed me the locations and we decided that New York, the New York store is actually the most, the most, um, the closest store, the one that we should go to. So then what we, we figured out was that um, she might not be able, like she has a bunch of American Girl doll stuff that she wanted to get rid of to make room for her new doll. And some of it wasn't, wasn't like really American Girl. It was um, the R generation that they sell at Target. So she wanted to, what I had heard was there's this consignment shop where you can sell this kind of stuff in Boston. So we went back to Google and we typed in American Girl and we found the consignment shop. Um, so then after, and we were able to uh, um, offload some of the stuff that she didn't want, she didn't need anymore. And then from there, um, the, the next thing that happened was she wanted to look at the dolls and figure out, like do some online shopping. Now, since we were stuck with COVID and we weren't gonna be able to go to New York, and figure out what doll she wanted. So we went back to Google, we typed in American Girl and we saw the product catalog. The reason why I'm telling you this story is because during this, this whole odyssey, and, and I can tell you that we, like two weeks ago, we actually did go to New York. We went to the American Girl style store. It was awesome. It was just me and my, my daughter for um, three days in New York. We had a lot of fun. But the reason why I'm telling you that story that sounds a little irrelevant or un, not relevant is because during this odyssey to, to figure out, you know, what, what we were going to do with my, for my daughter's American Girl doll trip, we ended up going to Google three times and typing in the same keyword, American Girl. But we had vastly different search intent. When I first went there, I was looking for an American Girl doll store. Then I was looking for a consignment shop. Then I was looking to buy a doll. So I was looking for the product category. And if you type American Girl into Google, you'll see there's also a magazine because I remember looking that up too. So it's just a quick story to illustrate how we don't always know the, the search intent behind any search query. And when it's a short query like this or a query like shoes or diapers, um, there's a lot of different intents. So what Google's gonna do is show a lot of different types of results. But if it's a longer query, like let's say I go to Google and I, I type in men's Nike red running shoe. Now all of a sudden Google really knows what the intent is. And for us as marketers, when we're evaluating keywords that we wanna create content for and trying to figure out what keywords we should be targeting, it's important for us to think in terms of search intent. If they're high, val like high volume, high search volume competitive keywords, there's probably a lot of different types of intent. And even though um, there's a lot of volume for those types of keywords, like a keyword like shoes, not all of those people have the intent that you want to target if you sell shoes. So there are different types of intent at a high level. Some of them are transactional, like I'm, I'm looking to buy something, um, or it might be informational. I want some information about the rash on my arm, something like that. 
or it's navigational. If I go to Google and I type in CNN.com, I'm really just navigating to the CNN website. Or it could be more commercial with more purchase intent. And I'll give some, some more um, just detailed examples here. So for commercial keywords, I could be looking to buy a product or it could be a local search where I'm looking for a local service, like some, somebody to clean my gutters. Or it could be a service search <laughs> where I might be looking for an online service like telehealth or something, um, or a local service, <laughs> which, is, um, which would be like the gutter, I guess. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of uh, search intent. So customer intimacy matters. And what we mean by this is the better you know your customers, which is basically what information are your customers looking for when they're making a buying decision. And the thing to point out is like Google knows. So when I typed in American girl into Google, like Google knows what people are usually looking for, even if it's a mixture of different intents. Google knows because Google has so much data. But for us as marketers, if we're selling a product, we need to understand what, what information are our customers looking for. And the reason why I'm showing a marketer here hiding behind her laptop is because the best way to do that is for us to talk to customers. And a lot of times for digital marketers, like we're hiding behind our laptop. Like we're putting up a website, we're putting up content, we're wondering why people don't convert or maybe we get lucky and people, people do convert. But knowing your customers and, and talking to them and not hiding behind digital channels is really important for us to be able to build targeted content um, that, that addresses the real search intent that our customers have. So remember, Google is analyzing click patterns. So if I type in shoes into Google, um, Google's showing some Google's showing some shoe stores and some shoe products and some other and some online stores. So Google, the way so Google knows what people are usually looking for when they type in shoes because Google can analyze uh, search patterns to figure out search intent. That's how that's why I'm saying Google knows the search intent better than you do because Google has just a ton of this data. A quick example here for search intent, the, we've done a bunch of um, work with 3D printing companies. If somebody types 3D printing into Google, I happen to know, and Google knows based on what, they're, what Google's showing in the search results, that people are looking for a service. So a local service that can print my design and mail me or deliver to me some of the some physical versions of the design that I created. So if somebody types in 3D printing, Google knows the intent behind the keyword is to look for a local service that will print some objects for me. If instead I go to Google and I type in 3D printer, Google knows that the intent behind this search is to is to find a um, a a machine, so a, a 3D printing product that I can buy, and I'm planning to do my own um, printing on my own new 3D printer. So the difference in search intent behind the keyword 3D printing and 3D printer is actually vast. One of them, the intent is to find a local service. The other one, the intent is to find information about a machine that you can buy. So another example here, if I type in best cars, Google is predicting that I will click on the cars at the top of the, of the um, page here, because I'm looking for information about some of these best cars that, that Google has identified. Um, also, Google thinks I might be looking for reviews, and that's why Google's showing reviews second. And then, and then Google thinks, well, it, it's also possible that the intent behind this search is really one of these questions. What is the highest rated car? Or what is the best car in the US? Or what's the best quality car, which is a, a different, different intent? Or what is a good vehicle to buy, which is another different intent? And we can see it by reading the results. This is what I call reading the results. If you want to know what Google thinks the intent behind a query is, type it into Google and read the search results page. Another example, football stadium. If I type in New York football stadium, Google, Google knows what we're talking about, MetLife Stadium, and Google thinks we're looking for information, how to get there, or information about the stadium or something like that. So rule number one, you cannot satisfy search intent with technical fixes or optimizations. That's why I'm, I'm down on technical SEO. Rule number two, you cannot 
satisfy search intent if you don't know what information your customers are looking for when they're making a buying decision. This is why I say talk to your customers. I, 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 um, I'm doing a stint right now as an entrepreneur in residence at one of Harvard's um, alumni entrepreneur programs. And I was talking yesterday to an, an entrepreneur and they're trying to figure out how to do their marketing. And I was telling them that what they should be focused on is talking to one of their customers on the phone once a day for until they have their all their marketing figured out because you're, you're just not going to be able to figure this out without talking to your customers that's why i'm always down on you know hiding behind digital channels and then rule number three is that you can satisfy search intent by providing a valuable answer to the right question you have to know what the right questions are and then obviously you have to have the the expertise to to answer the question so in a massive market, so Zillow is going after a mass market because they're in the real estate space. The way they're matching search intent is by publishing content that aligns with various search intents that their customers are typing into Google. So one of them is like mortgage calculator. So some people are, they wanna know if they can, how much house they can afford. So that's the intent when they type in um, mortgage calculator or even how much house can I afford? So if I go to Google and I type in how much house I can afford, Google's going to give me a, a mortgage calculator because Google understands the intent behind that search. And then there's a, a lot of other content that they're able to create um, to map, to align with a bunch of other intents. Um, like people might be searching for information about specific types of loans or, or things like that. And then in more of a niche market, the example I have here is a company that sells bonsai trees. The intents that they're going after, and this is so funny because my son is currently growing a bonsai tree and he's asking questions like, how do I get this thing to grow? When can I finally start pruning it? Because it takes a long time. Um, you know, how patient do I need to be? Where should I buy the, because he needs a pot for it. Where should I buy? So there's a whole bunch of different intents, but in a niche market, you're, you, once again, customer intimacy matters. So you really need to talk to your customers, get to know them. But once you understand the questions that your customers are asking, you're answering them on your website um, to match the intent behind the, the queries that they're, they're entering into Google. So I said before, read the results. If you're going after a keyword or you think you might wanna target a keyword like medical weight loss, type it into Google. When I type medical weight loss into Google, I see that Google, it thinks it's a, a local service that matters. If I wanna target this keyword and I'm not a local service, I'm going to have trouble ranking in Google because Google is showing local services. And I know that because of the map result that Google is showing right at the top of the page when I'm looking for medical weight loss. Um, so read the results to understand the search behind the query. Google's AI knows better than you do. So um, leverage that. And then some searches that are high volume and shorter queries are going to show a variety of different intents on the search results page. So now I'm going to talk about multi-factor authority. What this is about, then I'm going to talk, tell you about um, Fire Department Coffee, but I'm going to back up first. What this is about is, um, remember, back in the day with Google's PageRank algorithm, when Google first started, Google was determining authority by looking at links to your website. And that was by far the biggest factor. So what I did was link building, lots and lots of link building, lots and lots of spammy emails that I sent out. I'm sorry if anybody on this call got any of those emails. Nowadays, links are still important, so I'm not down on link building at all. We still do a bunch of that, but there are other ways to, to build authority, and, it's, and that's why I'm calling it multi-factor authority. What we used to focus on was content and link building. Now it's targeted content and multi-factor authority. So I want to tell you about Fire Department Coffee. They're a coffee brand. They sell coffee with a kick, and Fire Department Coffee was started by Luke Snyder. He's a friend of mine. He's a former client. Um, he took his, his SEO in-house, and I cried because um, they just have such an amazing brand. And Luke is such a great guy. He's the type of guy where um, like, if you meet him, you're, you just want to help him grow his business because he's a firefighter. He's a Navy veteran. The first three years that he was growing, he was building this company. He grew it to $10 million in revenue and he was still working as a full-time firefighter. That's what blows my mind. But he started Fire Department Coffee um, when he met his wife, she was roasting coffee. He wanted coffee with a kick because he was transitioning from the Navy to civilian life working as a firefighter. He couldn't find what he wanted, so he roasted his own. When he created his first batch, he sold it to people he knew in the fire services. And um, 
he gave away the proceeds and he gave away the proceeds uh, to a camp for burn victims. So fire department coffee is a, is a brand with a purpose. They still give a percentage of their profit to help out families of injured firefighters and first responders. So that's really what they're about. And what they were able to do was basically grow some awesome organic traffic. Like if you type in spirit infused coffee, when I made this slide, they were in the first three positions. And the way they did this is by telling their founder's story. So they took the money that most coffee brands would put into advertising or something like that. And they put it into content marketing around Luke's story. And Luke has an awesome story. He was a, a firefighter while he was building the company. And he was, um, he was a Navy veteran. And based on that, they were able to get backlinks. And um, you know, Google saw that they were a, a brand building momentum. So what did Google see? Google saw the engagement with the website. People would go there and stay there. Google saw click-throughs. When Fire Department Coffee came up, people would click on it in the results. Google saw mentions around the web. Google saw reviews that were entered into like Google's uh, reviews on the Google um, search results page. Google saw returning visitors. Google saw their content collaborations with influencers in the, in the fire services space. And then Google saw backlinks. So Google is noticing that this is a brand that's building momentum. And that's what Google's looking for. That's what Google's AI is trained to look for, not these technical signals or technical optimizations. So multi-factor authority is really based on expertise, authority, and trust. And their brand had backlinks. Um, and well, this is, this is what I focus on when I'm trying to build multi-factor authority. One is backlinks because they're still important, but also engagement. Google wants to see that people aren't bouncing. The two engagement metrics we pay attention to are bounce rate that you would find in Google Analytics, but also click-through rate on the search results page. Are people clicking on your um, page? And, and then Google reviews are important for authority. And then third-party endorsements. Google wants to see the company that you keep. So if you were like in the medical space and you were somehow affiliated with the Mayo Clinic, that's huge. And Google's looking around the web for evidence of those types of uh, relationships because Google sees them as endorsements. And they're one of many factors that goes into multi-factor authority. So when I interviewed Brian, or sorry, Brad Flaherty, who's the CMO at Fire Department Coffee, I asked him like, why did you guys do so well? Um, with SEO because you, your brand's just killing it with um, your rankings. And he said, it was really our connection with our community that was key to our SEO success. And if you stop and think about that, he didn't say core web vitals or um, you know, optimizing our title tags or H1 tags because um, nowadays, like Google's really training its algorithm to look for brands that are building momentum, brands that resonate with online consumers. And the, the factors I showed you on the, on the slide previous are, are really what Google's looking at to determine that. So that's a consumer-oriented company, an e-commerce brand, but it works the same way in B2B. So this is one of our clients, uh, the Zverse. They sell software that that manufacturers would buy to manage their manufacturing equipment. And when COVID hit, they started a campaign to protect a million frontline workers. And what they were doing was they used one of their like the machines in their facility to build these um, or to manufacture these face shields and give them away to healthcare facilities. And based on when they ran that campaign, they were they got links and engagement from a number of sources that are usually hard to get links and engagement from if you're doing SEO. And these were places like um, the California Board of Nursing, um, nursing um, unions, police unions, uh, things like that. And Google really rewarded them because, because they were showing this level of engagement. And then an, another B2B company, Hellstad, they sell materials to jewelers. So instead of, putting their marketing money towards advertising, what they do is they give away grants to up and coming uh, jewelry designers. So when they're doing their marketing, they're, they're basically getting the word out about their grant program. And that allows them to go to people in the jewelry space. And instead of saying, buy our, our materials from us or buy your materials from us, 
they're saying, you know, help us spread the word about our grant program so you can help us to reward and accelerate some up and coming jewelry designers. And as you can imagine, that's a much easier sell. Um, Google sees the backlinks, the engagement, the relationships, the third party endorsements of the grant program, and that that increases their improves their SEO and their rankings. So Google nowadays and their AI is really tuned to find brands that resonate with online consumers. I want to talk quickly about the complementary authority strategy. When you're doing SEO, you're going to create content. Sometimes um, the content is, well, what ideally what you would want is content that ranks for the right keywords and it helps you build authority. So it attracts links and relationships and engagement and all the good stuff that Google's looking for. What we do, because it's usually easier, is we, we have two types of content. So we're creating one type of content that might be FAQs or articles or collection pages on uh, e-commerce websites. And those are the pages that are optimized for keywords that we want to rank for. In addition to that, we create separate content that's for authority building. And this would be like the example I gave you where um, my client was giving away face shields to nurses. It, would be, it could be a page about that campaign, or it could be a page about a scholarship or it could be a page about the Hellstad grant, but this is content we're creating to build authority and it's gonna help the keyword targeting content to rank. So the important thing here is they don't need to be the same content, but you do want your authority building campaigns to be you know, somewhat relevant to what you sell. <laughs> so that, um, because ideally you'd be getting, if you sell auto supplies, let's say, then you would be getting links from other websites in the automotive space. So you do want to make sure that your authority building content is relevant to the content that you're trying to get to rank. So quick example here, I worked for a 3D printing company. They sold very expensive $1 million commercial grade 3D printers. The problem was it's hard to get to build authority in that space because there's only a a few trade associations that you can get links from and the engineers and the buyers, like they're not going to link to you or write about you, or it's not a consumer space. It's really a high-end B2B space. So what we did was the complementary authority strategy where we had pages on their website that were designed to rank if somebody was typing in commercial grade uh, 3D printers or professional 3D printers. But we also had content that was designed to get backlinks and, and engagement but for that content, we went after 3D printing hobbyists and we wrote content about issues that 3D printing hobbyists cared about because it was just much easier to get them to backlink and to engage. So that's the dual content strategy for this company that sells high-end 3D printers. So the company you keep matters. Google wants to see that your brand is associated with authoritative individuals and organizations. If you were in the healthcare space, that's the Mayo Clinic, that's doctors with letters after their names. In the, like if we were working with an, a, a healthcare company, I would wanna hire some MDs just so that I can put them on our advisory board and put them up on the website. Or maybe I'll have them review content. It's really hard to get an MD to write content, but I could have them review the content and put their name on it as reviewers, letters after their name, the, um, the hospitals that they're affiliated with, the schools that they went to, because I'm trying to build these affiliations and these partnerships. And then I want, those, um, if I can, I want those organizations to link back to us um, to, to prove to Google that we, we have those associations. So regardless of what space you're in, you want content partnerships um, and you want to show the evidence of those content partnerships on your website and on the, the your partner's website. And then also you want to show that you're members and active with trade organizations or trade groups and you have event collaborations. If you're doing virtual events like this or in-person events, make sure that Google can see that you're doing this stuff and you have these relationships. And then trust factors on your website. That could be like Better Business Bureau, even though that's, that's kind of played out nowadays. But anything you can add that shows your affiliations to the website, Google's looking for that. And remember, the humans that are training Google are looking for that, and that's why it works. Um, so old school trust factors are things like, we accept Visa, we're a member of the, the Better Be Business Bureau, which anybody can pay money to be a member of, um, or like our website is secure, we use rapid SSL, so nobody's going to steal your credit card information. That's old school, it, it might still help you if you to get transactions so people will convert, but what Google's really looking for is something like, um, I talked about MDs that are 
uh, affiliated with your uh, healthcare company, or maybe you're a member of the organic trade association, or um, I've been here that that's really a placeholder for your your doing in person events or virtual events in partnership with other organizations, and you really want to beat Google over the head, and make sure Google knows that you're doing that. So trust factors on your website that convey a relationship that is an endorsement of your brand, your website, your business. That's what Google's looking for. And it needs to be a trusted third party in your industry. So that's different from saying we accept Visa. <laughs> it's really it's really about, you know, what are those relationships? So for me, I run a digital marketing agency. You know, we focus on SEO. So there are a number of organizations in our space that I would love to do events with. Um, you know, I, I speak at um, Content Marketing World or, or HubSpot's inbound conference every year. And so those are endorsements by a trusted third party. And Google sees the fact that my brand, my business is associated with these well-known organizations in the marketing field. And I'm earning rankings that way. And this is, this is, this is like SEO 2.0. <laughs> it's really SEO uh, 10 nowadays because SEO has changed so many times. But does this one make sense? Because this is like an important point. You know, give me a thumbs up if this, this makes sense. All right, cool. So uh, we worked with a client, this is not our client, but we worked with a client in the addiction space. They were helping people um, overcome addictions, uh, opioid addiction. And you can see that this example here, they have relationships with Blue Cross, Humana, and Tufts, and that is awesome. But what I would do if I was working on their SEO is I would want Google to see in no uncertain terms that we have these relationships. I would want to make sure that we could publish something on their websites. They publish something on our website. Um, we grab, I, I would love to do an interview with the CEO of these organizations or anybody at these organizations, put that up on my website. I would like somebody from one of these organizations to review our content and I'll pay them hourly because what I really want is to use their name and the letters after their name on my website so that I can build that association. So Google knows that anybody can put the Tufts Health Plan logo on their website. So what Google's really looking for is evidence on the Tufts website or maybe in a trade association database or something that that, that association really exists and it's real. So crafting SEO strategy based on what we learned, and I, I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly just because um, we're going we're gonna to run out of time here. I want to leave some time for uh, Q&A. But we want to think about top-down SEO strategies. So the old way of doing SEO is to start at the bottom. Think about, think about your, your content, your, your website, your sitemap, your um, links, like that sort of thing. And, and that's the, the brand of SEO that's just not going to be effective in 2022. So the brand of SEO that will be effective is when we think about our overall marketing strategy. What's our messaging going to be? Um, is there some kind of purpose we're going to align our brand with from for marketing purposes or something like that? And then the example I have here is a company who, based on their marketing strategy, they decide to do content marketing and events. Um, and because they're doing events, there's going to be a PR component. And we want to make sure that the, the organizations we partner with um, are end up being third-party endorsements that Google sees. So you can see how that turns into a top-down SEO strategy where that basically, uh, based on our marketing strategy, we choose what type of targeting content and what type of multi-factor authority we're going to build out. And, and that's what Google will see. But it starts with having the right marketing strategy. I'm not going to go more into that. So we call it purpose-driven SEO because we found this to be the easiest way to really um, make, make a, or, or, you know, significantly grow organic traffic. Uh, what I've experienced recently is that if I'm only doing technical SEO on a website, they might get a 10% bump, but if I'm doing more authority driven, you know, purpose driven campaign, they can get like a two X or a three X bump and purpose driven campaigns can be based on a mission. If you have a mission, not every brand has a mission, especially in the B2B space. So it could be based on your product. And that would be like one of our, our clients. Um, well, I'm going to give, I'm going to show this as an example later. And then um, it could be story driven, like uh, the fire department coffee example. So quick example here for story driven. We had a manufacturer, we had a manufacturer we work with. 
They build Velcro straps that electricians use to bind wires together. That's all they do. The two founders of this company are manufacturing engineers. So what they know and what they're really concerned about is manufacturing their product. But it turned out that one of them was, was uh, volunteering at a trade school. And he really cared about helping young people find jobs in the trades, like good paying jobs. So what we did was we put together a campaign, we called it the campaign to recruit the next generation of electricians. And that allowed us to build authority around a mission driven, like purpose driven, sorry, a purpose driven campaign that was story driven around the story around how we were gonna help kids find these jobs. And that helped us build authority that helped us rank the pages that we wanted to rank when people are actually searching for Velcro straps. And then Candy Brand we worked with, Yum, Yum Earth, their candy uses organic ingredients. And we wanted, what we wanted to do was help other food companies understand that they can source organic ingredients too without a big hit to their bottom line and then use that to, um, to basically grow their authority. And then another example here that's mission driven. I fix it as an e-commerce site that I love. When I build an e-commerce site, this is exactly how I'm gonna build it. But what they do is they half of their website is an e-commerce store where they sell the parts that you would need to fix your, your own electronics at home. The other half of their website is all about advocacy for an issue that they care about. They really care about the right to repair. And that means that electronics companies need to release enough information that you can go to an independent repair shop, not the Apple store, because the Apple store has robbed me multiple times. Um, and I hope Apple's not watching this because they're going to turn off all my Apple devices, but I hate going to the Apple store because it's expensive. I can't afford it. And then the, the um, um, sorry, I got off onto a tangent there with Apple, but um, we, they basically do advocacy around this this issue. And because they're doing this advocacy, they're getting links and engagement from law firms that are also involved and advocacy groups and customers that care. And they're able to build their authority of that advocacy content, which builds the authority of the entire website. And that's how they rank the pages that where they're actually selling products. So why should your SEO have a purpose? Because you're going beyond keyword targeted content, you can create this authority driven content. Um, you're creating content that connects. Um, you're able to build partnerships because when we do our outreach, we don't want to promote our we don't want to promote our products. Like when we're trying to build content partnerships or get influencers to um, promote us, we would rather talk to them about the mission um, because we're reaching out to like-minded individuals and organizations when we're doing link building or looking for content partnerships. And maybe we could also do some good in the world depending on what your purpose happens to be. So your purpose does not have to be a social mission. So I really wanna banish that thinking. Your purpose does need to be authentic and aligned with your brand's values and your organization's values. And it needs to be compelling to the influencers that you wanna work out, that you wanna reach out to, like influencers that you want to promote your products or link to you or get engagement from. So it could be your founder's backstory, like fire department coffee or the craftsmanship behind your products. Uh, there was a wool brand we worked with that was very opinionated about how you harvest wool or it could be democratizing your industry or shopping local or something like that, like some kind of purpose behind your SEO so, so that you're able to build this type of authority. When you're building content for one of these campaigns, I like to create citable content. This is content, things like interviews or proprietary data-driven content where people who are like-minded will link to it because it's helping them spread their message. So an example of this, we worked with a financial services company where we interviewed immigrants in the US and they were telling their story. And we reached out to advocacy groups that uh, work on immigration issues and they linked to it because it was basically evidence that they could use during their advocacy. Uh, when you're doing outreach and email, pitch the purpose, not your products, not your service. The issue that we have when we're doing link building is nowadays when you send a link building email, people are gonna ask for money. And the way we get around that is with purpose-driven SEO. If we're reaching out to like-minded individuals and influencers and, and organizations, they're not going to ask for money because they're happy to promote it because um, it's a purpose-driven SEO campaign. That's the whole point. Um, I'm going to quickly, there's two more slides here. When we're doing a purpose-driven SEO campaign, the first thing we do is we think about who do we want our partners to be. Then we think of like, what's the campaign going to be about? And it needs to align with our values. Then we build the citable content I just talked about. Then we start connecting with like-minded individuals and organizations. That's how we build our SEO. Um, and I'm only gonna talk about the right side of this, which is that when you're doing purpose-driven SEO right, it becomes a flywheel 
where creating the citable content helps you to connect with like-minded individuals. That helps you to grow your audience and your organic visibility. That helps you to develop content partnerships. That helps you to build more citable content. You can see how it just keeps going and that's what we're looking for. So last thing I have here is if you're interested in these topics, I, I have more information. Um, I put together this guide. It's the Authority First SEO Strategies Resource Guide. So there are more case studies, the tools we use, and more information about like how we're doing, um, how we're doing SEO, like what's working for us today. You can text the word authority to the number 66866 or email. It's my email address. I'm always happy to talk about SEO. So that is it. Thanks so much, Dale. Your your passion for SEO is is apparent and contagious. Uh, so we're at the top of the hour. We have time for one question. So you'll get to answer your question if you unmute and you're the first to speak. I'm All sure right. there's a question um, out there. Yeah. And if you don't I, get to the question, email me. This is my email address. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I have one quick question. Um, Go for sorry. It. Um, let me switch my camera around. Um, yeah. So if a company is working with the government, and they, they rely on that. It's like a heavy source of endorsement, but the government is reluctant to appear on their side or any kind of marketing. How would you approach that? Yeah, it's very difficult. You're talking about like getting links or content partnerships with like a government. Yeah, just, just what um, the presenter was saying about if like playing up the partnerships you have beyond just a logo into like actively partnering or getting links, like having them, having them appear in your content. This, how if you're dealing with like a very sensitive client or like a very sensitive partner in that regard, how would you um, how would you approach that? So it might not be possible. Um, I would try to do some type of um, content partnership. If they can't participate in that, then ask the individuals that are your contacts for just a quote, like answer a question. I don't know what market you're in, but um, it, a lot of times we'll build content where we just ask people for a quote and they'll be happy to do that. And then they'll even link to it if they have the ability to link from like a government website. But yeah, absolutely. That can be very difficult for government sites. But you have to understand like the way you would do it though is to look at what they are linking to. And that's really the threshold to build something that is similar to what they're already linking to. But it still might not be possible. Thank you. And so and when Craig, it's not possible, you're looking elsewhere. So there's, you know, you you're so you're not going to get links and engagement from government agency. So you're looking for you're looking for other organizations and influencers that will that will link. We can all, we can go with one more question. I think Craig, do you have one? Yeah, I had a question actually. Um, <clears throat> so the part about intent is really good, but I'm wondering to what extent is it a good idea to sort of go with the pack or to differentiate from the pack uh, in your view? Well, it, what matters is what your customers are, are looking for, like what, what information they need when they make a buying decision. In theory, if all of those topics are covered, then, and, and let's say like the worst possible case, all those topics are covered and they're covered by sites that have, you know, 10 times the authority you do, you have, so there's nothing you can do, then, then you're screwed. Like SEO is just not going to work for you. Right. But but I've never seen that <laughs> like there's there's always been like when we're interviewing customers, we can always find something that the competition hasn't written about or the competition's not super, super authoritative. And we can write about the same thing and we'll rank and they, they won't because we have a purpose driven like authority campaign. So we have more authority. OK, thanks. And with that, I'm afraid we're out of time. So, Dale, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks everyone for attending. We'll be back All next right, week. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Very good. Take care.